Mr. Bud Burrell, you are, along with Susan Trimbaugh, one of the top authorities on naked short selling, which is a massive illegal crime that, by your estimates, has taken out over $280 trillion in illicit transfer of wealth. Before we get into the substance of this interview, let me just ask you to please tell us about yourself from birth through education, including West Point and your service to the nation, and how you ended up getting involved in the naked short selling investigation. Uh, so you'll know by background, uh, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I uh, earned an appointment academic competition uh, for West Point in 1964. And I uh, attended there, graduated in 1968. Then uh, did five years in the army as a finance and accounting officer. I served as special forces in Vietnam. I had the cash control job, which was very responsible. And subsequently, I came to work on Wall Street in 1973. And I was always, because of my background and in terms of accounting and math and so on, I was obviously constantly focused on special projects. One of the early special projects I was involved with was options trading. And specifically from there, I migrated into being a pension fund consultant and an internal R&D uh, uh, CEO of a subsidiary of Shearson Lehman. That's a background. And it, I've seen that since I left Shearson Lehman in 1987, uh, I've done really esoteric consulting work all over the world. So it's a background. A lot of well, I've, cer I've certainly world. noticed that you are the author of some of the most important publications in this area, and you are cited by some of the most important publications. Are there any that you want to mention, or should we just move to the next question? No, I could mention uh, Dr. Suzanne Trimbass of a new book, um, also the book uh, by uh, Robert uh, uh, Furness, whose uh, book was focused on the idea of short selling as a legitimate long-term strategy in, in equity portfolio management. I was also noted, I believe, by Dr. Uh, I said by we, uh, Mr. Jett, J-E-T-T, -T, and Wayne Jett is a uh, author of the, uh, one of the definitive historical books, *The Fruits of Graft*. But I was, I did it close to 100 radio interviews, three documentaries, uh, over 1,000 uh, blog entries, uh, a total of including opinions that I wrote privately for uh, victims. I produced close to 2 million words working with Wes Christian and uh, his counsels. And the bottom line is uh, that was the background. I, Worked for it nonstop for 10 years. I haven't really had to pay much attention to it since 2012. Well, fair enough. I think circumstances have changed. In 2012, all of you did everything right. You did a movie, you did Senate hearings, you had some awareness, but then it was undermined what I personally believe were corrupt evil forces. Now we have a new sheriff in town and the stars are aligned toward possibly forcing the issue of banking reform. One of the problems that we're facing is the American public that doesn't own stock shares directly is not understanding that Wall Street theft is impacting on their pension funds. And we'll get to that. So our next agreed on question, and others have defined the difference between short selling and naked short selling. So in this second question, just tell us, when did you realize that naked short selling was a sucking chest wound in Wall Street and also deeply harmful to the American economy and American society. I recognized it way back into the 1990s when I first saw the large scale use of it. And specifically, the NASDAQ rules that were ignored, the Reg T rules of the Federal Reserve relating to margin law, everything was ignored to the benefit of a, a group of uh, basically conflicted parties. One of the people who was one of the great beneficiaries of this was Depository Trust. And uh, they, their salaries exploded on the money they made from allowing their security to be borrowed, both illegally and illegally. And uh, there was a conspiracy of silence and, co and cooperation 
mounted by the federal regulatory agencies, the private regulatory agencies, the self-regulatory organizations, all to affect one thing, which was to preserve the ability of the firms to make the money they were making from shorting stocks to start, and later on many other securities. Um, at one point, I remember in 1999, uh, 80%, it was estimated that 80% of NASDAQ firm shorts uh, income was produced by short selling. And of that 80% of income produced by short selling, how much of that was naked short selling where they were using counterfeit shares and failing to deliver? It was at least half and it got larger. So we're talking- One of the, one of the points I want to make here is that this problem has not gone away because people quit paying attention to it. In fact, if anything, today, the problem is much, much bigger, and it involves securities well beyond the, the boundaries of just equity securities. It involves stocks, bonds, futures forwards, physicals, commodities, uh, currencies. Almost any type of asset you can describe has had what I call settlement abuses. No one is holding anyone accountable for failing to deliver. So they're selling false certificates over and over again. And what happens when people complain that they didn't get it? Or do they just think they own this stuff and it's years later that they find out they've been cheated? Effectively, they were stonewalled and or they were penalized for bringing the problem forward. People who came in and said, I want, a, I want a delivery of my securities, they are told, you can't have it. That's because the securities in many cases did not exist. This is virtual counterfeiting, electronic virtual counterfeiting of the securities that are being shorted. And the only way they can get away with that is because somebody's not enforcing settlement law. And it's law, it's not rules. And that's key to, to understand this entire scandal. It's law, not rules. You know, I, I, I'm going to ask you about the 7,500 countries that were destroyed, but let me advance that. Let me change the order of the questions. It, it seems as if there is complicity from the Senate Banking Committee through FINRA, through the, uh, uh, the uh, SEC, it's almost as if the U.S. government is a party to this crime. Do you have something to say on that? I would not say the U.S. government so much as I would say the deep state interests. And the deep state interests are significant. Those are people that hit, were making money off of, the, of having the system not work efficiently so they could benefit from taking credit for having corrected the errors of the system. And that was wholesale across the board and it reached globally. In fact, at one point I found out that one clearing operation was hiding its short sales done improperly for uh, hedge funds in offshore accounts based in England. I actually found went so far as to actually be given the account number that they were using even at the time, which I'm sure they've changed by now. But there's no doubt that in the context of there were vested interests of people on every level, from law firms to securities clearing operations, to broker dealers, to self-regulatory organizations, all of whom were benefiting financially from the short selling scandal. So the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, is he not paying attention? Is he part of the problem? He's part of the problem, specifically, it was hit under his regulatory purview that a lot of this stuff occurred. And he, every time anyone raised the question, they would go to their federal judge, and that federal judge would say, well, these guys have immunity. Well, there's no part, this is very, very important legally. There is no immunity, that's a very key word, granted to anyone by the Constitution for this type of fraud. This is willful counterfeiting, which is a class B federal felony. It's 25 years to life in prison for each charge. And the bottom line is this terrified many of these people when they were first put under the spotlight. And eventually though, they were all able to pull together their 
com common interest in preserving their legal status and not going to jail, not being fined financially for the damages they'd caused to companies. And I, you know, I, you mentioned the 7,500 companies that had been involved. That number could be materially larger. In fact, that was the, the correct number back in 2002. Let me just make a point before we go on to the destroyed companies. My understanding is that Wall Street was able to influence the senators on the Senate Banking Committee, who then introduced a law which made Wall Street immune from federal racketeering investigations. Is that your right. understanding? It is, but having said that, they, they don't have that ability. They can't, there, there was no law put before the House of Representatives and then confirmed by the Senate giving them the, uh, that immunity. They don't have the right, they don't have the ability to grant immunity between you and I, except for testimony. And the bottom line is this is one of the great frauds of this whole scandal. What I hear you saying is that Attorney General William Barr has all of the powers under law that he requires to do a federal racketeering investigation of Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, and all other parties on Wall Street that are doing naked short selling and cheating the American economy. Well, it's not just Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch. The biggest beneficiary of all this has been the depository systems, the custodians. And they, they have to be looked at too, because this couldn't happen without their cooperation and involvement. And they're being very well compensated for it. I remember that the CEO of DTCC made $300,000 a year in 1995. Right now he's making probably $5 million a year, mostly from the profits of them facilitating short selling or the loan of securities that are in their custody. Oh, I completely agree. And on our website, stopnakedshortselling.org, we're featuring all of the board members of the DTCC, basically every one of them a fox in the hen house. They're all parties to the naked short selling, as far as I can see. Let me move on then to the, the you're probably the top expert in the country, if not the world, on the actual true cost of this Wall Street looting spree, the greatest crime you've called it. So define for the average American what Wall Street has done in the way of destroying companies, jobs, and life-saving in inventions, as well as pension funds. All right, just to say, if, 70, if you accept 7,500 companies as of 2002, having been bankrupted or destroyed, the average amount lost in those deals was approximately $40 million per company. That's the market cap lost by investors and the bottom line is that those monies just disappeared in a 2000 uh, raid and that was a raid it was an attempt by the uh, government to reel in the uh, market because it was taking too much of an orientation towards the, the internet and the cycle technology they nearly read they nearly rally did wreck some very major companies but one of the companies I did some private work for had a market cap of probably several billion dollars. Uh, price of their stock was 83. They, before it was through, they did they got to down, down as low as 13 dollars. And when I looked at, I asked them who sold your securities. They couldn't answer me because when they went to the institutions that owned almost all their stock, none of them had sold. So the selling came from somewhere else. That's a crucial statement. Uh, and I, I, I want you to know, too, that I personally was involved with showing these issues to every attorney general at the time, every SEC chairman at the time. And there's no excuse for them to say they cannot plead. I call it ignorance. They now, were what, was their, what was their reaction when you briefed them? Did they say, Which, we'll uh, fix this? They went silent. It's a classic reaction of terror because they didn't want to say anything they might be held accountable for in the court. The problem that Wes encountered, if I could speak candidly, he couldn't get these cases in front of a jury. In every case, the, the judges would rule though, that this is too sophisticated a cause for a jury to understand it. That's crap. Bottom line is that they, they systematically blocked any attempt by the victims to get in front of juries. It was a disgrace.
I agree with you. And one of the reasons I'm such a champion of Sidney Powell, who is the author of License to Lie, and also General Flynn's lawyer, is because she has confronted prosecutors and judges who have been guilty of misconduct. And in my experience, these people are not stupid. They're very smart. Therefore, they are ethically challenged, and they're ethically challenged because they have been incentivized in some way to violate their oaths of office. So let's move on. Give us some examples of some of the companies that have been destroyed that would otherwise have been creating jobs and helping Americans live life longer and better. The companies I worked with, I cannot speak about because I can sign confidentiality agreements, but it's not hard to find companies that were wrecked. I remember Priceline survived despite these short sellers who drove them bananas, uh, went from three to 300 at one point on the rebound. But there was a whole series of companies that simply disappeared. NASDAQ would go to these small companies through its broker dealers and say, we can offer you access to the NASDAQ public markets for your capital needs. Okay, just go public with us so that we can get you on the board and then you can, we can open the doors for you to get this. That was for the most part a canard. These guys couldn't, what the companies found was that their access to capital when their stock was being crushed under a dollar was non-existent. And so if they got under a dollar and then they got deregistered, the short sellers who had driven those stocks there never had to cover their shorts. They had to, they never, there was never a closing transaction that would have been equivalent to a accounting revenue recognition event. Because of that, they, these guys essentially walked away with all their proceeds from their short sales without tax event. Not only without tax, but once the country's uh, company's destroyed, the stockholders lose standing and therefore it's the perfect crime. They, yeah, can't, they can't go after the people. That's correct. It was a, a really, it was a very perfect storm conspiracy, and um, I hate to use the word conspiracy because it's given a nasty turn, but I call it conspiracy fact, not conspiracy theory. I completely agree with you, and I, a lot of people don't know that the CIA invented the term conspiracy theorist precisely to diminish and marginalize those who were challenging the false official account about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. This is clearly yeah. a conspiracy. This clearly requires a federal RICO investigation. There are clearly at least a thousand people that should be put in jail. Uh, and there are at least a hundred companies, including Goldman Sachs, that should be required to make restitution uh, to the government and to the public. These, lo these, losses now, these losses now, are so large they can no longer be recompensed. They're too big to count, too big to, to, to settle. The losses in mortgage-backed securities, when I talked about three to four trillion of being, having been wiped out by short selling, I doesn't even address the amount of money that's been wiped out of mortgage-backed securities. The combination of multiple frauds in the mortgage-backed securities market has annihilated literally, in the case of Deutsche Bank, $55 trillion, which they have not taken the invisible loss on, and has caused the Federal Reserve to declare that the five largest U.S. banks have losses in excess of $280 trillion. And they can't sell those securities because in many cases, the securities represent mortgages that don't exist, properties that don't exist, appraisals that don't exist, you name it. It's vapor. I mean that in the worst sense of the word. So, I, I, I am looking forward to posting uh, many links to you. You will probably be the single biggest expert on our website that people can access. But I'm having trouble as I'm investigating this, and I've only been doing this for about a week and a half now, but I've been privileged to meet people like you who really know their stuff. I'm having trouble explaining to the average American why this great crime matters to them. I had a conversation with a very intelligent, uh, very well-known person who said that Wall Street is a rich man's crap game. It has nothing to do with me or, or the average uh, American. Can you help or address why that is wrong? 
nothing could be further from the truth about this not having an impact on the average American. The average American depends on his job. His job depends on capital. Access to capital is the key to that. The bottom line is anyone who says that is wildly unsophisticated. They don't, and they may be well intended, but understand this is a conspiracy just like counterfeiting a, a dollar bill. If you think your currency doesn't matter, and maybe it doesn't matter as much as it should, this is just like the fact they're making the securities that they short worthless. That's their goal, and that's what they're rewarded for. It's a systematic attack on the capital formation process of the country. And that affects everyone in every way. It doesn't matter what your level is. Down to the people working as, you know, bus boys at the restaurants or pickup boys in uh, Walmarts. I mean, everyone's affected by it. You know, that, that really strikes me as extremely powerful. Now, what about pension funds? Most people have either, if they're state employees, the state pension funds were turned over to the hedge companies. Many of the uh, private sector pension funds have been used as gambling chips on Wall Street. Can you address pension funds and how an American who doesn't own a single share of stock is actually invested in Wall Street and being looted by Wall Street? Well, effectively, so you'll, again, going, coming back to the issue of sophistication, it's, it's, it's important enough to pension funds that Japan just, just a few months ago banned it's pension fund managers from lending its securities to anyone wanting to sell them short. They banned it. I'm sure it drove depository trust and others completely crazy because they thought they had put, put that problem away. But they they were had they that was the most important single admission. The short selling was damaging markets and and quality of markets for securities, not just stocks again, but bonds futures, forwards, physicals, commodities, currencies, you name it. And how anyone thinks that can go on on a wholesale level without impacting our, mar our ability to create jobs and raise capital for real, uh, real businesses is just naive, if not stupid. Is there a class, uh, Susan Trimbaugh, when I interviewed her the other day, said that there are two classes of people that lose uh, to Wall Street. One class is the stockholders who lose their status, and maybe there's a possibility of legislating retroactive. I, I, I kind of doubt that. But the okay. other one, she said, were people who thought they owned stocks, but the stocks were never actually purchased for them. In other words, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, J.P. Morgan, Citibank, they've all been telling people that, yes, we've bought stocks for you, and here's your monthly account, and yet they didn't buy the stocks. That's fraud, and there's no statute of limitations on that, if I understand that correctly. That is correct. You should know specifically, for the purposes of the interview, these problems have become so big that I don't see any way to fix them except to go through what is called a reset. And that should truly terrify everyone because it basically would say, it's like the chess master teaching a, 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 a novitiate how to play chess. One of the classic exercises is to get it ha in halfway into a game and say, okay, he just wipes the board clean and says, I'm going to now do something different. I want you to play your game, your chess game, as if the pieces were still on the board. So that required the player to remember where all his pieces were on the board. A reset essentially is a clearing of the board. And the only way they can do that is to, they're going to have to essentially say with this because these problems have become so large that we have no way to fix them except to restart everything at zero. You know, this is really a fascinating thing that you've brought up because there are there are a lot of people talking, including Benjamin Fulford and Sasha Stone and uh, and others, about a global economic reset. Judy Wood is now working for the president. There's talk of an asset-backed, not just gold, but maybe gold, silver, and something else, an asset-backed dollar coming out. There's talk of a debt jubilee. What I, and, and let me also say that I believe that out of these trillions of dollars that have been stolen, it's possible the president has basically made the case to Wall Street 
you're going to give me $50 trillion in credit to work with, or I'm going to put a battalion of Rangers with bayonets uh, yeah. <laughs> up your butt. Um, it sounds to me like you're saying we literally need to clear the board, start over, but everybody that had an investment gets paid. Everyone that actually has an asset gets paid. And that, that means you can't have a counterfeit asset or a phony security or a fraudulent counterfeit security and expect to be paid. I did work on this going back to 2008. I was a, I was a CEO of a tri trading company. Eventually we had to move the company out of the US because of shorting. And it was for the uh, first patent for instantaneous delivery versus payment. Now, effectively, we took the whole U.S. company. We had it be acquired by a U.K. company. And the U.K. has very specific rules that if you want your stock in a U.K. company, you have to present evidence of having true stock-backed beneficial interest in the securities that you're asking to be delivered to you. These people couldn't produce them, and yet we got them repeated demands from various parties saying, well, we, we own this counterfeit stock. We don't know if it's counterfeit or not. We can, we don't, but we don't have a certificate, but we have a settlement from you know, the, the broker-dealer. I said, sorry, if you don't have a stock certificate with a number on it, you don't own the stock. We, didn't, we never delivered the stock to those parties. Now, you and I and others have talked about how the companies like Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, have basically stiffed people who asked for certificates. They've delayed, they've lied, they've canceled accounts. Um, you've also talked about how terrified Wall Street actually is that the American public might wake up and realize that there is no stock market that can be trusted. As our president has said, the system is rigged, and he meant every system, not just the political system. What I would say to you, if one, America one thing, gets terrified tomorrow? One thing that would really make a point. This should terrify not just Wall Street, it should terrify every American citizen. Everyone loses if Wall Street disappears because it's the capital formation intermediary. And the Wall Street that I worked on doesn't exist anymore. It's gone, those guys are gone. You got Goldman is still alive, Solomon Smith Barney is still alive, you know, Morgan Stanley is still alive. But having said that, since the time that I was there back in the 1973 time frame when I entered, 150 companies were consolidated by Shearson alone. There was a massive, you know, non non avoidable consolidation that took in everybody in every possible market in every possible way. And the bottom line is, no one could resist it. And no one tried to. They didn't know what they weren't. They weren't technically sophisticated enough to even manage it. And the few firms that survived survived because they had they kept rigorous control on their own capital. And the other firms, there were some good firms too. I could go through a whole list. The only good competition in Maryland had good body. This guy was the 1968 time frame, five years before he came in the industry. But the way after that, Faulkner Dawkins. Uh, Hayden Stone, I could go through a, a whole list of firms. Uh, Prudential Securities, which was the old Bayesian company. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket science to tell you how bad this consolidation was. It was horrific. Let's, uh, it, it let's... was like everyone started picking up chairs in a, in a game of musical chairs. And when they finally got through and settled down, they realized they'd picked up so many chairs, no one could ever get a seat again. Let's draw to a close here. We're hitting our 30 minute mark and this is almost a perfect segue. Jack Welch, when he was walking out of the White House said that no matter what people say about President Trump, he's a businessman. He understands transactions, he understands true costs. And Jack Welch said, this was the first guy I've ever talked to that's been president and understood business. You are the top authority on all of this. You've talked about a reset. Let's say you run into President Trump. He has a two minute ex uh, attention span. What do you tell the President of the United States? Clean up the capital market formation process, protect every company, not just the vested interests, and do it with, with ruthlessness because no one yet has really gone to jail for these family of manipulations, no one. 
and that's why they're continuing on an unabated and much larger level than when I was involved. Let's end on that note. People need to go to jail. God bless you, Bud Burrell, West Pointer, served your country. God bless all of you watching, and God bless the President of the United States and every single American citizen who depends on Wall Street to have integrity, which it does not, sir. All right, sir. Thank you very much. God bless. Bye-bye.